Well, the G20 summit in Russia is underway right now. The president, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in this thing. I would love to be a fly on the wall. But, I, again, I, you know, it's, I had a debate with Horace Cooper about this last night. He ended up, he and I ended up shouting so loudly at each other that uh, the entire TV studio, which has offices attached to it, everybody just was like, ah, what's going on? Because we were just, ah, right. Um, I think that the the whole this 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 whole issue, a whole variety of issues that need to be addressed are not being addressed because of the Syria thing. And in the context of the Syria thing, what Horace was trying to do is he was he was going off on this. Oh yeah, here's Obama leading from behind again. And it's like, you know, the right wingers, they've got their two or three bumper stickers that they want to slap onto President Obama. Which which causes it to look like I'm agreeing with that bumper sticker. I don't see Obama leading from behind. I think, you know, this it's it, it, what the hell does that mean anyway? Right? I don't I don't recall that Dwight Eisenhower was landing at Normandy with the troops. Are you saying Eisenhower was leading from behind? He was, but you know, but they they figure out these, you know, Fox News and Frank Luntz. They figure out these these little catchphrases, and 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 you know, try to apply them to the president. Yeah, I agree. President Obama painted himself into a corner, certainly inappropriately, maybe even stupidly, and I don't mean like he's a stupid guy, but I mean you know, like it was a dumb thing to say. By saying, well, you know, if they do chemical weapons, that's a red line in, you know, in the sand for us. Oh, wait a minute. Are you sure you mean that? I mean, shouldn't you be saying it's a red, that should be a red line in the sand for the United Nations? Shouldn't you be saying, well, I, you know, if, if they use chemical weapons, I would hope that uh, President Putin would join me in, in saying that that's a red line for any nation. And there's no doubt in my mind that to this day, the president is regretting having said that and is trying to figure out how to get out of it. And again, this is, you know, you get back to the Fox messaging. Oh, he's trying to weasel out of it. He's trying to walk it. Well, to a certain extent, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that in the first place. And now he's got this problem. And he's trying to, you know, look strong through it and also be constitutional about it. And I think it's just, it's, biting him in the butt, and I think it's going to bite the Democratic Party in the butt. And that's not, that's not even, you know, addressing the real issue here, which is that human lives are at stake. And that you've got a humanitarian crisis that involves millions of people that is not being adequately addressed in the Middle East. And by the way, it's not the only one. There's a humanitarian crisis and a civil war going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo that is in many ways far worse than what's going on in Syria. But, you know, DRC, they don't have oil, they're not near Israel, they're not part of the Middle East, they're not they're close to Europe, they don't, couldn't be a pipeline to Europe, they couldn't be a pipeline to anybody else, you know, quack, quack, quack. Although they do have a lot of mineral riches. So we're starting to see, uh, you know, the interest of some nations there, but... But it's a bad situation. I mean, we just have to acknowledge this. It's a bad situation. It's a bad situation that was not, in my opinion, handled well. Getting, you know, having John Kerry go out and make a, a, a Winston Churchill speech, followed by the president saying, well, not so fast. Let's talk to Congress first. Is not helping. Should have been better coordination within the White House. Or if the president was going to have a come-to-Jesus moment, which he apparently did Friday night, after Kerry made his speech, it would have been useful had he had that moment the day before, or at least warned his secretary of state. So, you know, all of this said, it's so easy to sit behind a microphone in a comfortable studio in Washington, D.C., without, you know, and knowing that while my words may have some influence... I'm not the guy who's going to push a button that's going to cause people to die. 
or prevent people from being killed. You know, the Monday morning quarterbacking is really easy to do. And there's a, there's a certain amount of cowardice is the wrong word, but there are so many commentators and I, you know, I guess in some way I fall into this category. I'm trying not to. But there are so many ca commentators who are just glibly saying, well, this is what it should have been. This is what he should have done. This is how he screwed it. Well, here's what he, you know. This has been going on for two and a half years in Syria. And frankly, as I said yesterday, I think this began in a big way, in a modern way. In 1998, when the Project for New American Century begged Bill Clinton to bomb Iraq with a letter that was signed by Jeb Bush. May we never forget that. And others. i got to print that letter out one of these days and keep the list in front of me so I can just fast forward through it. But in any case, that, that was the modern day birth of it. But there were births before that. When Iraq, back in the 1950s, as I recall, democratically, you know, overthrew a military government and democratically elected, uh, as my recollection is, his name was Mossadegh, democratically elected a president. And the democratically elected president of Iraq said, uh, we're going to keep the oil for ourselves. And so we sponsored and overthrow that government, and we installed Saddam Hussein. Same thing happened in Iran. Iran had a democratic election. They elected a guy. Maybe Mossadegh was their guy. I, it's, been, it's been a while since we've done this topic in any kind of depth on this show. And we said, no, you can't have that. We're going to bring the Shah back. I mean, we have been making mistakes in that region for a long, long time. After World War I, you know, we took the Ottoman Empire and we carved it into pieces. We took you know, four different states and turned them into Iraq, for example. So this is not, you know, I mean, it's Obama's problem right now. It's in his lap. But this is not a problem that was caused by President Obama. This is not a problem that was caused even by George W. Bush, as comfortable as it would be from that, you know, glib commentator's seat to try and lay it on him. We have had arguably almost 200 years of American foreign policy. You want to take this all the way back to the Monroe Doctrine when President James Monroe in the 1830s, as I recall, said words to the effect of anything that happens to any country anywhere in the, in the Western Hemisphere is the business of America, and we therefore have the right to interfere and intervene. Thank you, Shano and Danielle. They just printed out the PNAC letter. Here's the guys who signed the letter. They said, they called it a Reaganite policy of military strength. This is their phrase. Such a Reaganite policy of military strength and moral clarity may not be fashionable today, but it is necessary if the United States is to build on the successes of this past century and, in, and secure our security and ensure our security and greatness. Right. This is where they say if we shirk from our responsibilities, we invite challenges to our fundamental interests. This is, you know, this is basically where they were they were begging Bill Clinton to go into Iraq. And it was signed by Elliot Abrams and Gary Bauer and Bill Bennett and Jeb Bush and Dick Cheney, who was then the president of Halliburton, and Elliot Cohen and Midge Dector Forbes and Paula Dobrinsky and Steve Forbes. I'm sorry, Midge Dector. Steve Forbes is the Forbes name. Aaron Freiberg, Francis Fukuyama, who has since really walked back fast from being a neocon. 
Frank Gaffney, Fred Ickle, Donald Kagan, Zalme Kalazad, Khalil Azad, Scooter Libby, Norman Potterts, Dan Quayle, one of our great intellectual giants, Peter Rodman, Stephen Rosen, Henry Rowan, Donald Rumsfeld, Vin Weber, George Weigel, and Paul Wolfowitz. So, I don't see any easy answers here. The one thing that I do see, personally, is that we should not be investing American treasure and the potential of American lives in any more military misadventures in the Middle East. I'm all in favor of providing humanitarian assistance to refugees. I'm all in favor of building schools and hospitals, particularly in the countries that we have devastated, like Iraq and Afghanistan, and the country that we devastated called the United States of America. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. But I, at the bottom, at the end of the day, my, my favorite statement is that from Merle Haggard, it's time to put America first. <laughs>